Well, good evening, friends. Wednesday, the 28th of October, and uh, we're gathered again tonight to study the Bible and to pray together in our Zoom groups at 8.30. Now, as you know, on these Wednesday evenings, we are looking together at the book of Psalms, and we come this evening to the fourth Psalm. It seems to me that Psalm 3 and Psalm 4, they kind of belong together. Uh, Psalm 3 is often referred to as being a prayer for the morning, while Psalm 4 is referred to as being a prayer for the evening. And the particular historical context seems to be the same. Now, as we come to Psalm 4 this evening, not everybody would agree with me here. Uh, but I am pretty convinced that the situation in Psalm 3 and the situation in Psalm 4, that David is speaking here about the same problem. Absalom, his son, has driven David out of Jerusalem. He is making a bid for the throne. He desires to become king in place of his father. He's a godless, rebellious young man. And uh, he has driven his father away from the city. And that seems to be the problem. That seems to be the background to the situation in Psalm 4 as it was also in Psalm 3. Psalm 3 would appear to be a prayer which David offered in the morning at some point when he had to flee from Jerusalem. And Psalm 4 would appear to be a prayer that he offered in the evening at some point, having fled from the capital city. So that's a little bit about the background uh, to this psalm that we're looking at together uh, this evening. But we hope that it'll touch us in our lives. We need to feel the touch of God upon our lives. And we need to hear the voice of God speaking in to our lives. And, and he does this as we come to his word. It's here he speaks to us. It's here he touches us. And it's my prayer, because we need it tonight, that we'll, we'll hear the Lord and that he'll speak to us in his word. So let's pray together just now. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the book of Psalms. We thank you for the rich variety that we find in the book of Psalms. Uh, we praise you for this Psalm before us this evening, Psalm 4, we ask that you would give us an understanding of it, the context in which it was written, the spiritual truths that are contained therein, and give us ability, we ask, to apply these truths to where we are at now in Northern Ireland, 2020, in the midst of global pandemic. Help us to take your word and by your spirit drive it home to us. Whoever we are, wherever we are, come to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, the first thing we need to do is to read the psalm. So if you've got your Bible there, or you've got the phone, or whatever, uh, but please uh, do turn to the psalm, Psalm 4, and we'll read these eight verses together. This is the Word of God. Answer me. When I call, O God of my righteousness, you have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O man, how long shall my honour be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell 
in safety. Amen. Now, many years ago when I was a young boy, I think it was about 10 or 11 years of age, my father was involved in clearing out a house in Lisburn. Uh, my great uncle and great auntie had lived in this house and they had sadly passed away. My father was their next of kin and it fell to him to sort out the house, to clear out uh, the furniture and all the other bits that were there and to prepare the house for sale. Now it so happened that that meant that my dad was going up after his work and after tea quite often for a period of time uh, to Lisburn uh, from our home in Belfast uh, with the intention of clearing out the house and sorting out all the bits and pieces and going through the papers and all of that. And I used to often go with him. Uh, and so the day came when everything seemed to have been sorted. There was quite a lot of things left in the house. But there was uh, someone from the auction was coming with a van and they were going to take away the furniture and all the other bits. It was the last evening that we were going to be there. And my dad said to me, now, you've been here and you've been helping me. And uh, I, I wasn't really thinking that I had been helping much, but I was, uh, I was pretty chuffed, you know, when my dad said, you have been helping me. Oh, I was just a young lad. I thought, oh, oh that's pretty good. And uh, he said, well... You can have a souvenir from this house. He said, because to be honest, son, the furniture and all here, that's not worth very much. And anything that's left here, it, it's really, you know, it's not really worth much. And it'd be quite okay for you just to, you know, go around, you just choose something. One thing, one thing you could have from the house. So I lifted from the wall a, a picture, a, a, a painting. Now, it wasn't a Van Gogh or anything. It was a picture of a man in a sou'wester and wet gear and he was on a boat and uh, he was uh, steering the boat. He was at the helm and he was steering the boat. And, and it was evident from the painting that a storm was raging. Uh, the sea was battering into the boat uh, and uh, it was at night time and there he was standing, steering the boat. His face and his features facially completely calm. Completely calm. And I can't remember if there was a caption on the picture, but if I was putting a caption on the picture, I would have called it peace in the midst of the storm. Peace. And here is David. He is in the midst of a storm. Uh, we saw this last week, and I'm not going to run over all the same ground. This is his son who's leading a rebellion. He's been cast out of the capital city. He's been driven away from his kingdom. An attempt, a serious attempt has been made to rebel against him and against his authority and to seize the throne. He's, he's God's chosen one, the one whom God has set over the kingdom. But nevertheless, he is having to flee. And, of course, there were divided loyalties. People that he thought would remain loyal to him have gone over to Absalom. Uh, people who he thought were his friends have let him down, uh, have failed to flee with him and have chosen to remain with Absalom in Jerusalem. That's David's very personal storm. But notice here what he says in the last verse of this psalm, verse 8. In peace I lie down and sleep. For you alone make me dwell in safety. Even though all of this is happening to him, and it's really horrendous, even though the chips are down, he is able to go to bed and sleep at night. You know, I've been blessed with uh, the ability to sleep well, and rare are the nights when I would be awake. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. It is a great blessing. I know some of you, you, you don't have that blessing. Uh, but there have been nights, of course, when I've been anxious about things and they've kept me awake at night. And here is David in the midst of all of this pressure. The storm is raging around him. But he is at peace. 
What's your storm? Well, we've all got a storm. It's called the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, we don't, again, need to run over that ground. We ran over it last week. And we run over it every day, maybe several times a day. The storm is raging around us. But maybe tonight that isn't really your big storm. Maybe relationships are falling apart. Your marriage is not in good shape. Financially, you feel you're about to go under. Spiritually, you're making no progress. In fact, you feel you're going backwards. There's problems in dealing with people. Whatever your, your big situation is tonight, that's your storm. And you want, as a Christian, as a believer, as one who has faith in the Lord Jesus, you want to know something of this peace that David was experiencing in the midst of his storm. And how do we get that peace? How do we obtain it? How can it become a part of my experience and of yours? Well, there are three things to notice here in uh, the psalm. Three things, uh, please. If I want to know this peace, the peace of which David here speaks, the peace that can be experienced by Christians, by God's people in the midst of the storm, there are three things I need to bear in mind. I need, first of all, to make prayer a priority. Make prayer a priority. What is David doing here, as he was doing in Psalm 3, in the midst of the storm? He was praying. Look at verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. He's praying. He's calling on God. He's remembering that in times past, God has helped him. You have given me relief when I was in distress. He's recognising that he doesn't deserve anything from the hand of God. Be gracious to me. I'm not coming to you, Lord, and demanding this and that and the other thing because I deserve it. I'm dependent on your grace. So he's praying. He's appealing to God. He's remembering God's faithfulness. And he's conscious that he needs God's grace. And as you look further on in the psalm, you see his confidence in prayer. The second part of verse 3. The Lord hears when I call to him. So if we want to know this peace that David ultimately experienced, then we have to make prayer. A priority. Call unto God. It's David's knee-jerk reaction here. Call unto God. The God who has been faithful to you in times past. And as you come to God, recognise that there is a sense of which you don't deserve anything from his hand. Uh, and cry to him that he would be gracious to you. And come with the confidence that we see in David. The Lord hears when I call to him. And then notice especially in relation to prayer, the first part of verse 3, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Now there is a sense in which this is a unique reference to David personally. God is in covenant with David. God has chosen him to be king over Israel. And so as you read this verse, you are very conscious of the special relationship that existed between the Lord and David. He is the one whom God has set apart to be king. And yet there is a sense, legitimately, in which we can apply this statement at the beginning of verse 3 onto every one of us who are Christians. The Lord has set us apart. We're his special people. His eye is upon us. We are the apple of his eye. 
So if you want to know this peace, and you do want to know it, I know you do. If you want to know this peace, then you need to make prayer a priority. Cry unto God. May prayer be the knee-jerk reaction of your heart and soul in time of crisis. Cry unto the God who is righteous and faithful and gracious. And cry unto the God who will hear your cry. You're special to him. You're being set apart by God. And have the confidence that we see in the psalmist that he will hear your cry. But something else, if I want to know this peace in the midst of the storm that we've already uh, reflected on, we need to make prayer a priority and we need to cultivate an attitude of silence. We need to cultivate an attitude of silence. Verse 4, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Now, what's David saying here? He has every right to be angry. His son is rebelling. But more than that, Absalom is leading a rebellion against the Lord's chosen and the Lord's anointed. That is grievous and terrible sin. There's a huge injustice here. A huge injustice in what is happening. Uh, David is in the right Absalom is in the wrong. So he has every right to be angry, or maybe your footnote says, as my footnote says, be agitated. And I quite like that rendering of the word here. Be agitated. He has, he has every right to be agitated, but be careful that your agitation and your anger does not take you over, does not master you. Be careful that in your anger and in your agitation, you are not given over to sin. Don't let your anger and your agitation master you and consume you and lead to outrageous statements and actions that are grievous to God. No, no. Instead, go to your house, lie in your bed, think it through before God what's happening. Be silent. Be silent. That's my understanding of this statement. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and be silent. Don't put all your energy into crying out against Absalom. Don't put all your energy into crying out against the injustice of what's happening to you. Talk to God about it. But be silent about it before men. I think we've something to learn here. We who come from and live in um, Northern Ireland, and I say this as much about myself as about anybody else, not having a go at you. It's uh, self-inflicted as well. We like to talk. Boy, we can talk. And sometimes we, we get into a lot of sort of what I would call blah blah stuff, you know. He said to me and I said to him and she said to me and my next door neighbour said to her and then she mentioned to his uncle and his uncle told my cousin and this blah, 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 blah. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not just. The way I've been treated. They're not being nice to me. I'm, I'm in a mood. It's not right. Be agitated, yeah probably isn't right what's happening to you but be careful it doesn't consume you be careful it doesn't take you over it doesn't master you and, and leads to a situation where you're saying things and doing things that are in themselves sinful go to your room lie in your bed talk to God and be silent So if you want to know this peace that David's experiencing here, you need to make prayer a priority. You need to cultivate an attitude of silence. Channel not your energy 
into crying out about the injustice of the situation and crying out against those who have been unkind to you. Leave it with God. And then thirdly, remember what you have and what they don't have. Remember what you have and what they don't have. Don't you see it there in verse 7? You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. Well, Absalom and his followers, they're there in the city and, oh, they have all the luxury. Uh, they have the nice divan beds when David and his uh, followers are fleeing and they're camping here and there. They've got plenty of food when David and his followers aren't sure where their next meal may be coming from. Ah, oh, they, have, they have lots of stuff there. Absalom and uh, his forces... Uh, there's there's luxury for them while there's hardship for David's followers. Uh, but I have more joy in my heart, says David. I have more joy in my heart, uh, much more than what they have. And I'm more richly blessed than they are. You see, this is the perspective of a spiritual person. Okay, in terms of material wealth and uh, all of that, they're doing pretty well. Yep, they, they're certainly better off than I am. Yep, uh, they, they certainly have more than I have. And uh, they've got a swagger to them. They've got a swagger to them. Oh, they're, they're fine in terms of this world's goods and all of, all of that. Ah, but they don't have Jesus. They don't have Jesus. They don't have the joy of Jesus in their hearts. We who are in Christ, we have everything. We have everything. Don't get overly agitated about the seeming successes of the men and women of the world. Don't get overly agitated about those who are godless who seem to be triumphing. Oh, they may be doing well, but they don't have Jesus. And they don't have the joy of Jesus in their hearts. You want to have peace in the midst of the storm? Make prayer a priority. Cultivate an attitude of silence and remember what you have and what they don't have and rejoice that you have the Lord. What greater blessing is there? What greater blessing is there? We have the Lord and the joy of the Lord. This is to be prized above everything else.